And if you suffocate, you can still have the uh, the windows, mm. hoping that they will have stopped. Inshallah. Good morning, uh, everybody. So uh, it is an honor for us to uh, receive Vincent Lemire, director from the uh, CRFJ. It's uh, the Centre de Recherche Français à Jérusalem. It's a, a center of research that is uh, affiliated to the uh, CNRS. Anyway, so uh, Vincent uh, and the CRFG uh, very kindly uh, invited us in June for, to, uh, to attend a conference they had uh, at the CRFG about um, Latin epigraphy in the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem with a special mention of the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, and that was Alexandre. You were there, Christophe also. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexandre was uh, in all the, uh, <laughs> the sessions. Uh, it was a great, great conference mm -hmm. with also very nice encounters and uh, even uh, workshops. So we were uh, cutting stones in, uh, in the middle of the, uh, the conference. Uh, so um, also the, uh, the, the reason that uh, I wanted to invite uh, Vincent to inaugurate this uh, customary uh, DS Academicus that we have at Polis to launch the academic year is uh, because uh, we thought in Polis to, uh, to develop our interest to Jerusalem, Jerusalem as a whole, would like to open a Jerusalem studies program in the future. So uh, Vincent is the ideal person. As you can see uh, on this uh, PowerPoint, there is uh, this project that is an immense project, Open Jerusalem, the idea of opening the archives of Jerusalem to the researcher, not just the historian, but uh, all kinds of researcher. And this is also one of the uh, features of uh, Vincent's um, research interests is always multidisciplinary and a, always groundbreaking questions. Because when you open a, a center of, uh, of uh, research on Jerusalem, you say, okay, we'll speak about uh, the heavenly and earthly Jerusalem, the holy and unholy Jerusalem and all this. But you have so many more questions. And I think the archives are here to, uh, to answer those questions. So Vincent uh, published this year, 2022, the English edition is about to, uh, to be uh, published in, uh, next year, Au Pied du Mur, and that will be the case study of today's uh, lecture of Vincent. Um, Au Pied du Mur, so at the foot of the wall, the Western Wall, and uh, the life and death of the Maghrebi quarter in Jerusalem. Uh, Vincent has also other kind of book. <laughs> uh, I really Next recommend week. this one, it's great. It's, uh, Next week. Yes, uh, you'll speak about it, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's a cartoon about uh, the life of Jerusalem uh, throughout history. So thank you very much, uh, Vincent, um, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Henri. Uh, thank you to everybody to be here. Um, and thanks to, to Henri, Gorina, and all the staff for this uh, invitation. Uh, I will not deliver a very academic lecture, but rather uh, the narrative of a personal experience and journey through this uh, linguistic uh, archipelago called uh, Jerusalem. And you will uh, understand why. So yeah, I will try to speak about the Mogabi neighborhood at the end of my presentation, but first I will present the Open Jerusalem project. Um, why? Because, of course, I'm very honored to deliver the, the DS Academicus lecture in this prestigious uh, institution devoted to language studies. So I'm honored, but uh, also I'm a little bit intimidated because I'm not good at all in foreign language. Uh, not at all. Um, which is which is bad news when, when you are working on the history of Jerusalem. And so, of course, I did learn some Arabic. I spent one year in Cairo in British Council to learn Fusha, and it gave some results that, you know, uh, you have to practice and so on. 
it's always the same story. Uh, I did learn some Hebrew in several Ulpan in Jerusalem. It was the same. And <laughs> so the, the, the results were, were, were not excellent. Uh, and more than that, I, I understood that it will be never sufficient to work on Jerusalem archives in the 19th and 20th century. Because of course, I should have learned not only Arabic and Hebrew, but also and mainly Ottoman, Osmanli, uh, Old Turkish, uh, Greek, Russian, Armenian, Ethiopian, German, and every languages. Because if, <laughs> if Jerusalem is a world city, you have to learn every language to study. So it was an endless uh, project. And so I, I, I tried to think about it 22 years ago, 24 years ago, when I was here for my uh, master. I tried to bypass this uh, personal and global obstacle. And first, I, 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 choose to, I choose to work on very specific matters uh, that, gave, that gave a global point of view on the city. And so I spent my PhD working on the water supply in Jerusalem. Uh, this is uh, my PhD it was, uh, I defended it in uh, two, 2006, the first of Jerusalem, hydrohistory essay. So history of Jerusalem through the water supply issues. And it was a good idea because it gave, of course the water supply, you know, you know Jerusalem, the water supply is linked with religions, with archeology, span but also with modernization of the city and also with geopolitics issues. So gives you a kind of global vision of the history of the city, modern history of the city, but, but through a very specific and concrete uh, uh, issue. And after that, I had the idea to, to this, this was an academic lesson first, and after that it was a book in French and in English and other languages. Uh, and I tried to make a snapshot of Jerusalem in 1900. Of course, it's not 1900, but like the years around 1900. And again, it's a kind of chronological coring, and it helps to travel inside the archives because you can arrive in every institution and say, give me everything you have around 1900 without choosing, and you see. And, and with this snapshot, you try to understand uh, uh, several things. So first, thematical coring. Second, chronological coring. But after that, it was in 2012, I was stuck. I was blocked. I, I, I didn't have any other good ideas or let's say tricks because it was tricks. And so I, 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 I didn't know how to move on, how to, to progress. Uh, uh, and so I decided to, for better understanding the global history of Jerusalem from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of 20th century, which in my opinion is a key period to understand the history of Jerusalem before and after. Um, I decided to launch the Open Jerusalem project, which is a collective project and a digital humanities project. So this project was, the Open Jerusalem project was the result of, of, of this deadlock, of this blocked uh, situation. So yeah, I was not good in foreign language, but from this, and I am not good in foreign language still, <laughs> but from this kind of disability or even handicap, I conceived of, kind of creative solution, which gave, of course, at the end of the day, much more result than if I tried to learn some of these languages. So in this lecture today, I will try just, I don't know if we will have time, but just to frame the theor theoretical challenge, to present this linguistic archipelago, uh, to present the methodology, uh, to present the Open Jerusalem portal, because I think that even you as students, you can use it in your everyday uh, lessons and so on. You have uh, many, many thousands of documents there in many, many languages. And after that, I would try to spend like 10 or 15 minutes to 
speak about the Mograbi neighborhood, the history of the Mograbi neighborhood, uh, which is how uh, Henri told, published in French and uh, by Stanford University Press in March in, uh, in English. It's uh, on the press. So, what quickly, what is the theoretical, uh, theoretical challenge? Uh, the, when I was, uh, when I began to work on, on, on the Open Jerusalem pre project, the idea of the project, I, I wanted to work on this very period, the middle of 19th century, middle of 20th century, because I discovered that, that the thing that you know, of course, that late Ottoman and Monday period is much less studied than biblical time than Crusades period and Israeli-Palestinian conflict, so before and after. But this period, or the late Ottoman period, the historians, they don't like late autumn. They, they don't like late periods. <laughs> like flourishing period. They don't like it. It's like a decline or something else. But they, they don't like it. It's like garbage, you know? So they like to work on Solomon the Magnificent, but Durhamid, it's... So, and the Mandate period, it's... Even yes, it's an in-between period, in between Imperial Ottoman time and of course Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. So I had the, the the idea that we have to work more on this very period. And as a thematical consequence, uh, I saw that the emergence of modern urbanity in that period was generally forgotten. So most of the historians put back the history of modernization in Jerusalem after, let's say, LMB, okay? But more than that, uh, uh, I, I, I underlined that there was mostly the linguistic obstacle because most of the historians of this period are working in a single language and so on a single community. The Armenians are working on the Armenian, the Greeks on the Greeks, the, the Latin on the Latins, and even among the Jews, the Sephardic on the Sephardim on the Sephardim, the, the Ashkenazim on the Ashkenazim, everybody is working in his language, in his community, because of linguistic uh, you know, deadlocks and because of politics deadlocks. You work in the community where you have possibility to work with. And so you have the good passport, you have the good connections and so on. And these linguistic obstacles uh, um, built, built uh, a history of Jerusalem, which is segmented uh, like a piecemeal and largely disconnected from urban reality. And so the Open Jerusalem project was a kind of global and innovative answer to this, uh, to this uh, obstacle. And that's why, of course, I asked for a transnational funding. It was more efficient to work on a transnational history of a transnational city to ask for transnational funding. It's better not to have like get a French flag on your head <coughs> or English flag or German flag or any flag. European flag is a flag, but we discussed a lot of it with Bernard. European flag is, uh, yeah, it's a flag, but it's more than flag. It's uh, a coalition of countries and so it puts complexity in the... <coughs> The framework. So, yeah, just one example. I, I, I gave always this an example because it's from my PhD. Uh, this is a picture taken. This is Berkata Sultan here. This is Yemin Moshe <coughs> here. You have the old city back, and you have the road to the Cinematic and the Clerem and so on here. Okay. And this fountain is still exists, of course. And this was the inauguration of new waterworks uh, on the uh, on the 27th of November 1901. You have this picture. If you want to understand what's going on, you need uh, at least all this. You need access to all these archives because Ottoman Imperial Archives in uh, Istanbul. Because you will discover that this inauguration takes place on the very birthday of uh, the Ottoman Sultan as you know as a gift and because of course he gave some money it's it's an imperial uh it's an imperial uh, ceremony let's say jerusalem municipal archives because the engineer who who drives the, the the works 
uh, from Gabe here, this is the Greek, Orthodox Greek, uh, was the guy who conducting the, the, the works, so the, the maps and the budget and so on. <coughs> Islamic work for Kai and Abu Dis, because this aqueduct was a wax Islamic foundation. And so the, the core budget of this work was funded by the uh, uh, by this work uh, uh, created by Suleiman the Magnificent uh, uh, in the same time then with the with the with the works. Palestine Exploration Fund Archives in London, because this picture, this very picture is kept there. You just find it there in London and Muse. German Protestant Institute Archives in Jerusalem, Mount of Olives, because this picture was taken by Konachi, very well known Konachi, who did work for, among others, for the Palestine Exploration Fund, but who explained the, the context of this picture in his personal archive, which are kept at the German Protestant Institute. And the Universal <coughs> Israel, Israeli type, uh, Alliance Israelite Universal, uh, you know, this uh, school directed by, uh, uh, directed by mostly by, by French or Syrian, Syrian French, uh, Albert Antebi, <coughs> because Albert Antebi, who was a member of the municipality in that time, personally was personally involved to ask the municipality to have this point of distribution of water supply for the Jews of Yemen Moshe. Okay, so you understand, and, and with the archives of Albert Antebi, kept by the Alliance Israelite University in Paris, you understand that why are they taking this, this picture here? Because they want to make big co municipal communication about Jerusalem municipality is not only devoted to the Muslims or to the Christians, but also to the Jews of Yemen Moshe. Okay, so it's kind of scenography, a real one. <laughs> so you see, you need just this, and this is one example out of thousands and thousands of examples. Um, the, the, just a word about the conceptual framework and, and the thematic focus. Uh, we did work on, we did focus on, on, on this concept of public space, public good, <laughs> uh, um, and because we try, we 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 yeah we we thought that this kind of conceptual framework is the good one to renew the history of imperial mixed and or divided city, and so that we have to work not only on let's say religious or patrimonial issues, but also on the global notion of public space with the municipal archives, with the judge, uh, jury, jury, jury judicial archives, imperial archives, Ottoman. We do have to work on the public time. Uh, we made a lot of work on the famous clock tower that was built on the Jaffa Gate. Uh, how to build a public time in Jerusalem. It's an issue out of the, 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 the different hours of prayers of every communities. How to build the municipal time to make appointment in between different communities. Um, public opinion, petitions, the local press, the Chambre de Commerce, and public knowledge, the libraries, Halidia, of course, <coughs> at the printing press and the religious school. Uh, the methodology, just a few words about the methodology. We, the, the key uh, option was not to immediately go towards the digitalization, <coughs> digitalization of document itself. It was the main option that of many, many projects. It's not the first project about archives in Jerusalem. It's, there were dozens before and there will be dozens after. It's, we are in the middle of, you know, in the middle of a mess. But a lot of projects focused on digitalization and it had, in our opinion, it caused two problems. First, it's, co it's costly. But second, and maybe it's more important, when you go in, when you just knock on the door to an institution, 
especially in Jerusalem, and you say, hi, I want to digitize your archives. The door is closed. <laughs> because this is digitalization, you know, of course you keep the papers, but the, all the documents are out of control. So it was the, the, the I think the very, the, the good idea of the project was to say, hi, we're not interested in digital, digitalization, but we want to help you to know what do you have. So we want to localize, to index, and to, to better understand what do you have. And maybe by chance, after years, and when the trust is built between us, maybe you will, you will you want to digitize, and maybe you will, you will be happy to share the, with us or not, but it's not our goal. And so it, it changed, totally changed the, the dialogue. So we offer you yeah, like expertise, competence, hours of work to help you to understand what you have and what you, what you don't have. And so this was the, yeah, this was the more or less the global, uh, uh, the global uh, roadmap to locate, to prioritize, to collect, to describe and to valorize. Uh, to localize, of course, we had to take many, many planes. So this project was done before the Corona crisis. If not, I think project had collapsed because we had to work to, to, to travel in Yerevan, in, in Amman, of course, in Addis Ababa, in Istanbul, in Vienna, in Berlin, in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, in Washington, in London, in, in many, many more places than this, uh, this map. This is the map of the preservation places where the documents are today. Because one of the specific situation in Jerusalem is that I don't know other city in the world where the documents are spread everywhere, and even because of strategic uh, issues. The institutions here knows that, yeah, this city has had and will have like conflictual history. And for the more important documents, you kept it with the central institution in Roma or no, Yerevan or Moscow. So this is part of the, the problem. Or sometimes solution. Because sometimes it's easier to work in Yerevan than in the Armenian Patriarchate. <laughs> we, we succeed in work to work with the Armenian Patriarchate, but by making some travels from Yerevan to here, <laughs> which may as into here and to, you know. Uh, so yeah, and the second step was to make the distinction between which is key in the archivistic uh, methodology to make the distinct distinction between authors and producers and of course conservation institution of the documents. Sometimes it's the same. Sometimes the mayor of Jerusalem writes uh, a note. So he's the author. The producer of the document is the municipality of Jerusalem because he is acting as a mayor and the document is conserving in the municipality archives. It's one case, but usually it's not that case. Usually you will have one engineer with the author, for example, from Gabe. Uh, sometimes he kept the paper with him for different reasons. Sometimes the paper are still in the, uh, in the, in the, in the institution, so the producer is the institution, but sometimes the conservation places change because of political or geopolitical uh, uh, incident. And in Jerusalem, there was some incident. So sometimes you find documents in places where why these documents are here. Sometimes it's very simple. It's just because, I don't know, maybe in 100 years, we will discover the archives of police institute in, I don't know, another institution, just because unfortunately police institution disappeared or moved. And here you have another institution and downstairs, the papers are here because the archives usually, a lot of people, they don't care about the archives. So it's just the institution who are moving and the paper are not moving sometimes. So it's a very complex, uh, you know, heuristic, uh, strategy to build. 
uh, you have to distinguish between categories of producer. And of course, in Jerusalem, in local administration, consulates, foreign consulate, patriarchate, and so on. And for each category, you will have different, different strategy to access or not to access. Um, sometimes, as I said, the, 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 the documents had moved from from the producer institution to the conservation institution. And sometimes in another, in another country or very, very far away. And just one, one example, of course, the consulate archives, it's always the same. The consulates, they, they usually they don't keep the documents by themselves. For French, for Italian, for English. For, so the consulate archives are in Washington, in London, in Roma, in, Paris, not Paris, but Nantes, but and everywhere. So it's the, the, the concept of repatriation. But these archives are not always well described. This is the story of the Italian consulate archives that we discovered in Roma. And we did open the vendors, but ourselves. It was not open. <laughs> so it was just like it was transferred, I don't remember when, yeah, 20. Uh, 95, 95, and we discovered it uh, in 2015, so 20 years after. And the bundles were still like that. And it's, it makes sense to manage the archives. It's very costly in hours, in competence, in expertise, and so on. So, and just to show you that in the, in the Italian consulate archives, you don't see only documents about Italy in Jerusalem, or even not about only about custodian or uh, Catholic issues. Of course, for example, you will have a lot of documents about the Ethiopians because the Italians had direct interest in Ethiopia. Yeah. Ethiopia. So you have you have this kind of connection, crazy connection. If you want to work on the Ethiopian community in Jerusalem, you have to go to Rome <laughs> in the cons Italian consulate, after, which which is not. A direct, uh, <laughs> but and one example out of dozens and dozens. This is a small history in in Sofia, Bulgaria, because it's it's a strange story. Archives, it's paper, and the sometimes for different institution, the value of the documents and the content is less important than the value of of the of the paper itself. And in um, 1922, 23, 25, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, like hundreds of uh, cubic meters of Ottoman documents were sold to, uh, I don't know, uh, papetier, like uh, stationary. The, what? Stationary. Stationary. The, stationary. What the, yeah, the, the factory who, 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 who produced the paper sold everywhere in Europe, in Italy, in Central Europe, and so on, by train, you know, like, and by chance. And by chance, one train was stopped in Sofia because it's, you can have a book on it, because some Ottomanist, old Ottomanist in Istanbul made petitions and so on and say, stop, you are destroying all the Ottoman history and blah, blah, blah. They managed to stop this train. There was, of lawyers coming, end of the story, the train was blocked for eight years in the very station of Sofia. And at the end of the day, the National Library of Bulgaria say, okay, it's raining, uh, let's take these papers and we will see. And the papers are still here. And among these papers, so it's, it's dozens of cubic meters, we discover these documents about Jerusalem. Just, just to make you some glimpse, to, and so it's not as that big, but it's very qualitative because it was fiscal Ottoman series about Jerusalem, which we didn't manage to find out in uh, Istanbul. Um, yeah, of course, we have to map the, the preservation places in Jerusalem, uh, in Israel, in East Jerusalem, in the religious institution, Islamic court with many, many, of course, political issues. 
And imagine the archives of the Islamic court, you know, were under Haram al Sharif, and they moved in Sherjara. And after that, during the 80s, it moved in Abu Dis because of security issues that the, the, the Palestinians so that it was not sure to get this document in Sharjah. And so it, it, now it's in Abu Dhabi. So you have to, and what you, you understand in just, you understand that the history of the archives is the history of the city itself. It's not separate, it's of course. So you have to have a global uh, view about that. Just to explain you that, of course, it was, it, it was and it is still a very big, team, we had a core team, we had a core team with 10 searchers and like 60 searchers were involved in this, uh, uh, in this process uh, in like 12, 12 uh, 13 uh, con different countries. After that, we have to collect some documents uh, in 15 countries and in 80 uh, collections, which is 80 uh, uh, conservation institution. The example of the Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman archives, the Osmanli uh, Archivi in Istanbul, you know that now because, even because of the political situation in Turkey, the Ottoman archives are very well funded. Very well funded, much more than 20 years ago. Because, you know, the re-Ottomanization uh, of the, you know, the national ideology had Direct, direct results uh, on the on the archives, and this is the team involved in the collection in Istanbul, uh, led by uh, Yasmin Adjer, uh, Turkish uh, uh, researcher and colleague. And in Istanbul, the institution, because they wanted to valorize their work, they said, "We will scan for you and for free every document that you will collect." Okay, so on the Open Jerusalem portal, you will find not only the indexation, but the very document themselves, like picture of all the items that we, uh, that we uh, selected in the, in the archives. Okay, but it was their decision. And it was because they wanted to valorize even outside and, you know, it's a European project. So it's, kind of, it's a part of diplomat, cultural diplomacy. Uh, this kind of uh, this kind of document created collective petition of Jerusalemites to thank uh, the Ottoman government for the improvement in public security in 1846. It's crazy, it's crazy. The content, the signature, who signed, who didn't sign. Do you imagine how much you can understand about the society with just this document? Collective petitions. Uh, Later, uh, for example, a petition just from the Syria community of Jerusalem signed by 419 people signed, you know, signed is the steps. So here, the documents is the steps. The petition is very simple. I think it's, I think it's again, yeah, thank you very much for, I don't know what, that's money or something. But here you have like a snapshot of the community. So the petition, yeah, we, we focused a lot on, on the petition, just to say that petition was very important in the Ottoman administration. It was a, it was a way of, of governing the, the, the empire. And just to say that at the end of the, at the, end of the, the Ottoman period, the, the petition were sent by telegraph, on telegraph form, like very, and you made petition for everything, to ask, to thanks, to, Denounced to for everything to Istanbul, and after sometimes it goes back to the local governor and it's circulated. Even the linguistic analysis of these petitions gave a lot of information. So it's not only in Turkish, of course, uh, in Ottoman. Sorry, in Ottoman Turkish. Yeah, you have two thirds in Ottoman Turkish, but you have sixteen percent in Arabic. You have four four percent in French. You have ten percent of Ottoman Turkish translation of other language documents, and it's, uh, you have few Greek and few Syrian. The petition in Greek they are in the Greek patriarchate mm -hmm. because for the Greeks, you know, it's 
it was it was the the, the idea in that time it, it still more than the idea they are their own power they even done right to the to the sultan or sometimes but very rarely so you will find a lot of petition but not here not in istanbul in the greek patriarchy this is Yerevan, the archive of the it's not the archive of the armenian patriarchates it's the report, the annual report written by the Armenian Patriarchate to Hmeyadze. You know, like, like the report that you send to Rome or to your institution. These reports are always problematic because, you know, I think all of us had written some reports and the main idea is everything is okay. <laughs> First, and second, we need money. <laughs> you know, we all, so, and it's always the same. <laughs> and if there is big, big troubles, you won't see it in the or internal troubles, you won't see it. And so well, it's always that. It's still it's something. But what what is interesting is that you have some Armenians, you have some French, you have some French uh, in every every document. Sometimes you have Armenians and French. But the thing is that the archives of the Hmeyadzin, uh, yeah, the Hmeyadzin archives were nationalized. By the during the Soviet times, that's why we have access. By the way, because now it's national archives, so it's kind of global legal uh, access. But it's Soviet archives, so it's described in Russian. So you have Armenian document written in Armenian described in Russian. You need you need two peoples. One very good in Armenian, one very good in Russian, just, just to, to manage this document. This was Addis Abeba because we discovered a lot of documents in the uh, uh, archives of the Archbishop of Jerusalem. But to have the access in Jerusalem, we had to travel many, many times to Addis Abeba <laughs> to get the steps, just to get the steps. And like going back and going back. And at the end, it gave a lot of results. Uh, just to say that it's an endless history, last week we discovered a lot of archives from the Archbishop of Jerusalem in the personal archives of Sister Abraham. I don't know if some of you knew Sister Abraham, Abraham Christian Petersen. She was a Swedish, she was a Benedictine. She knew 14 languages and she was the specialist of the Ethiopian community in Jerusalem. And we met her in Abu Dhabi when she was very old. And she passed away. And the Benedictine opened her room and discovered like 30 boxes of books and documents and so on in many, many languages and in American in guess and asked us, can you help us? Because we don't know how. <laughs> and we discovered that Sister Abraham helped the Jerusalem uh, Ethiopian Archbishop to manage the archives in the 80s. But some of these archives are still there. So in the coming weeks, we will put it back to the uh, Ethiopian uh, Archbishop. Sometimes we, we decided to, to, to uh, go in on qualitative validation. Uh, for example, we discovered this kind of history of the Ethiopian monastery of Jerusalem, the famous Dar es Sultan, which is a very strange text, very, very strange. It's many, 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 many mistakes everywhere, but that's why it's interesting. And so we published it in Ethiopian, in English, in French, and with big analysis in French and, and, uh, and in English. Uh, in Russia, we did work in St. Petersburg for the Tsarist. Uh, uh, period and in Moscow, of course, and just to say that, of course, in Russia, we did work with insiders and in many, many places we we had we made this choice because because of political uh, situation, it's not possible to come in and even, of course, today but in Russia, but even even uh, 10 years ago, you cannot knock and say, hey, we are French or European, West European and we want to work on the Russian interest 
on Jerusalem. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> so I, I think I don't have to explain. Okay. There's a hospice here, the church there, the link between all the orthodoxy and the Greeks and the Russians and so on. So for these archives, we had to work with, of course, Russians, uh, colleagues, excellent colleagues. In Rome, I have to say, of course, there was many, many, many documents. This was the archive of the White Fathers about uh, Santan, uh, the Assumptionist. And just to say that religious archives are not telling only about religion. This is the inventory of the object kept in Notre Dame de France in 1918. When they, when they had the building back, because they, it, it was occupied by the Turkish troops. So they want just to see what was stolen and what was not. And so you have everything. And even, I don't remember, you have two cows, Vachelettier two, Genis two. You have some, some uh, cell, I don't know how to say that. Uh, two. Yeah, yeah, everything, everything. The, the, the. So here you have a snapshot of Notre Dame de France just before, not just before, but just after the First World War. And uh, yeah, it's uh, escabeau, prix Dieu, chemin de croix, I don't know, bannière, drapeau, couvre-tel, and the kitchen, moulin, café, poêle, rotissoir, <laughs> cordeau de cuisine, couteau à pain, assiette en fer, sous coup de bol, everything, everything, everything. So, beurrier, moutardier. <laughs> uh, this was the, the archive of the French consulate. So, it's in Nantes. But was not, but in the, with the with the consulate archives, we, we we had an agreement that we asked an archivist, Adelaide Lalou, of a student, uh, to resume the material classification and to deep the description, <laughs> and just to see again that, for example, the French consulate archives. It's not only about the French politics and strategy. For example, here you have a file about municipal taxes. And so, because they have to pay, they try not to pay as everybody, but they nettoyage, cleaning, lightning. And uh, so you can have some many, many information about the municipality uh, fiscal uh, uh, framework with the French consulate archives. Here, it was uh, a fight about the, the fake uh, money uh, around Jerusalem and in Jerusalem. So examples of fake, uh, fake uh, money. <laughs> Uh, yeah, again, in the, in, the, in the French consulate archives, a lot of documents from Russia, from German, um, from German consulate, in French, of course, from Ethiopian, just to remind us that these people were sending as many letters as we send WhatsApp a day. And when you send a letter, the letter is kept with the guy uh, to which you send it. Just, this is the global uh, thing. So the letters sent by the, the Consul Imperial de Russie to the French consulate is kept by the French consulate, of course. So correspondence. Um, this was the French uh, archive from the central uh, uh, administration, just to say that, yeah, it was French, but we described it in English. That I didn't say it, but it's important. We described all the archives in the native language, plus in English. So there was two layers of description in the native language, because it's the only good way, the rigorous way to describe the document, plus in English, because we want to help the searchers to cross the different documentation, as I said at the very beginning. This is Berlin, and Berlin, this is this, you know, this very complex political issue of the Prussian slash German archives in Germany, but a lot of them are still in Israel, as you know. They, because the, the, the German consulate was closed in 1939 by the British, because there is a war between Great Britain. So, the, the German consulate in Jerusalem was closed, 39, and it was never opened again. Mm -hmm. And in 48, of course, the Israelis, they took it. 
and they still had it. So, and so, and they, after that, they had a deal with Berlin to make digitalization during the 70s. So in Berlin, you will have the digitized, old fashioned digitized document that you find in the Israeli state archive. Okay. In, in the Israeli state archive, you find a lot, a lot of documents from everywhere. Sometimes we decide to digitize because there is an, an issue, very important issue. Uh, we discovered in Haifa University, it's a long story, one version of uh, microfilm of the Islamic courts of Jerusalem archives. And it's very difficult to have access to it. And it's a very important document for, for example, for the Palestinian uh, students who wants to work on the social and economic history of Jerusalem, because the Islamic court of Jerusalem, of course, was involved in every communities, even two Jewish, uh, uh, two Jewish people who were in, uh, in a battle for money or debt, they go to the Islamic court. It was the central court for, for everyone, out of, of course, civil wedding. And so in Haifa, we decided to, to digitize uh, all these 100 volumes on, on this period. You have the volumes from the 16th century till uh, our days. So it's uh, 15,000 uh, pages. And so now the researchers, even the researchers who are in Birzeit and who cannot have access to this document because they are in Abu Dhabi or in Amman or in uh, Haifa University, they can have access online. Just, just to put the difference between scanning and take pictures. At the end of the day, we decided that it's more simple just to take picture of the document. It's, if it's uh, making in, in a proper way, like for example, in the National Archives of London, this was the 57 volumes of the Consulate Archives, British Consulate Archive of Jerusalem, very rich and on this period and so we yeah we took picture and we put we put it on the on the on the web so you we, you will find it on the on the open jerusalem portal because it's public archives and because it's freely accessible and you can make it accessible same for for the u.s consulate archive but of course of course it's less it's five volumes uh, more or less in the same period uh, two thousand uh, pictures and we did it by ourselves. It's very, very simple. It was in uh, Marinon, the, the volume that I, I pictured. And sometimes, yes, just by iPhone or because you can make digitalization with this kind of stuff now. Uh, we don't have time to develop because in Jerusalem there were many, many, many strange archives. But just another story, the Sephardic Communities Archives are in the municipality of Jerusalem because the archives of the Sephardi community were kept in the same building than the Palestine Post, who were exploded in, I don't know, remember, 46, I think. There was, uh, yeah, an explosion uh, during the, the war. And, and so the building was uh, in, 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 in fire. And so the, um, the firemen, they put all the archives that they found on, in the street. And the municipality of Jerusalem took it as Palestine Post archives. And the Palestine Post, which here now is the Jerusalem Post, they, they, they uh, had back the, the archives, but the Sephardic Communities archives, which just because it was in, in the same building, are still now in the municipality archives of Jerusalem. And because this community as an institution is not existing anymore, now you have many, many different Sephardic communities, the archives are still there because there is no institution who has the jur juridical right to, to, to have it again. Um, yeah, this is family, family archives, for example, Alcuderia, Archilidia, printing press, uh, Franciscan custody, and so on. And of course, there was an issue about storing, securing, and sharing the, this kind of documents because, yeah, the Dropbox exploded <laughs> once. So we used this big uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, yeah, and so it, it, now we have this, uh, this uh, Open Jerusalem portal. 
it's it's uh, built on the atom uh, uh, tool atom is an open open source application uh, made to describe all kind of documents and archives that you can find uh, so it's open source it's uh, remote access it's available on the web it's multilingual and multi-alphabet which was very important <laughs> uh, it's uh, you have multi-referentials, possible language institution producers, funds, name place, name of people, etc. And it's built on the International Country of Archives standards. So it's and UNESCO, for example, choose Atom to manage his own her own archives like uh, 15 years ago. At the beginning, it began just with an Excel table. It's very simple. And at the beginning, it began with just to translate the dates of the documents. For example, for Ottoman documents, of course, you have to put it. But even for the Ethiopian documents, you know that the Ethiopian document, you have seven years, just seven years different, which is much more perverse than in Ottoman. <laughs> because, you know, this date, you say, no, 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 it can't be. It has to be at the end of the 19th century. But seven years, <laughs> come on. And sometimes the documents are in Gregorian dates because the guy is writing to, I don't know, the Latin patriarchy. So it's, uh, or in the Ethiopian calendar, just seven years. This, the public time, just when I said the public time, it's not in the time of the, in the, in the day, but the public time, which year, which year are we in Jerusalem? And not only, uh, Hebrew and, and etc. So yeah, just to show this is a atom uh, under layer. So just to show you that it's multilingual and multi-alphabet, which is very important. Of course, you have Armenians, uh, you have Russians, you have Greeks, uh, you have Arabic, you have Hebrew, and so on. Uh, and yeah, and this was the problem, the big problem of the transliterations for the for the search engine. <laughs> Endless uh, issue, transliteration. Uh, Khalidi, how you spell it? With the E, with the H, with that H. Uh, all the place names, all the. So we tried to work with auto suggestive input. Auto suggestive is what, what use Google. Uh, began and they, they, they finish. Or elastic search. Elastic search is you type one word, and the search engine is trying. It's, it's made an elastic search, so it's trying to think about how you would have type in a different ways. But it's very, very costly in, uh, as I said, in computing power and development because it, it, it was not working. So we just use the what we call the power of asterisk. Power of asterisk. It's crazy. It's when it's thing when when you play at Scrabble, asterisk is like a white letter, so it's every letters. And for Magaribe, you have three results, but for M asterisk D asterisk R asterisk B asterisk, you have fifty results, all related about the Mograbi neighborhood of Jerusalem. So just just to show you that the asterisk is the and I told you in every search engine, always use the asterisk. And um, yeah, for example, the I break or E or, so you can put keywords, you can put keywords with asterisks, you can put phrases, the Damascus gate, you can put, of course, Boulogne, Boulogne search, Jerusalem and Hebron, Jerusalem or Hebron, Jerusalem not Hebron, all the, and you can filter the, the results. You can filter it by date, by type of archival record, by repository institution, by creator, producer, by language of the material, by publisher, and with or without digital object. Uh, this is the main um, uh, database. This is the language of the, of, of the material that we have. Ottoman Turkish, 10,000, Greek, Arabic, English, Russian, French, German, Italian, Armenian, Amharic, Hebrew, Turkish, Latin, and here, the repository, so the place where you can find the document now. And you will have another thing with the creator of the document, which are or are not the same institutions. Okay? 
Ottoman archives, Jerusalem city archives, Greek Orthodox patriarchate archives, uh, etc. Central Zionist archives, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, it could be bleak, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's also a collaborative work table, and it's, maybe it's important for you to understand that you can, with, with this tool, you can, of course, you can have your own uh, uh, baskets, but you can create cards and you can create private or public. And so you can, because what, what we said about the documents written in many, many languages, sometimes you need more than one people to work on it. So the Open Jerusalem project is a tentative way to create like collective reading tables. So you can, because you have this expertise, you need someone who can read another text and someone who knows, who cannot read any text, but who knows some things about the context or, or some things. And so the students uh, in, in the US, they use a lot uh, this, uh, the students, it, it's very easy to, 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 for, the, for the teachers to, to create like uh, work uh, group of, of uh, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, it's already 12. Let's take like maybe 10 minutes about the Mugabe neighborhood very, very quickly, just as, uh, because it was an application of the Open Jerusalem project. It, but not only, because of course, it's a long history, it's beginning the Saladin time, and it goes after uh, after 48 war, but of course, we can say it reversely, we can say that I could not have done this work without the Open Jerusalem project. Uh, and mainly because, uh, because it gives it gives me the, 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 yeah, the conceptual framework to think about this global city and to understand not only that Jerusalem is a global city, but some of the neighborhoods in Jerusalem are global neighborhoods. And it's, it's true for, it was true for Musjara, it's true for the Mogabi neighborhood, of course, but it's true for many, many neighborhoods here who are connected with different places in the world today and before, and even before. Uh, more, more before than uh, than today sometimes. So I think all of you knows the, the big picture of the history of the Mogabi neighborhood uh, created by Saladin uh, at the end of the 12th century and destroyed um, by the Israelis uh, uh, at the very end of the Six Days War. And it's the neighborhood was just here in front of the Western Wall. Um, for for this. Uh, to understand the history of this neighborhood, I had to work on the same kind of, uh, of strategy uh, than I used with Jerusalem, because I had to work in Abu Dis, in the, in the Aukaf archives, in Amman, for the Jordanian period, uh, in the French consulate archives, because it's a Mograbi neighborhood, and so between 48 and 62, it was a French neighborhood, because the French consulate considered that Okay, they are Mughrabi, so they are French. And so um, Israel archives, of course, uh, Zionist archives, because as you know, I think uh, you know that the, the, the Zionist organization tried several times to buy the, this very neighborhood before its uh, destruction uh, in Istanbul, uh, uh, Ottoman uh, archive in Ankara, uh, in London, in the United States, and even in international uh, institution, because after the destruction of the neighborhood, like Red Cross, uh, uh, Red Crescent, uh, UN, UNESCO, uh, before it, uh, Société des Nations, so in Geneva or elsewhere, manage, uh, 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 try to help the, 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 the population of the neighborhood after the destruction of the and of course, Rabat, Maroc, Archive Royal, Royal Archive of Rabat, Algeria, difficult, Tunisia. Uh, just to, um, this is some archives of the of the of Abu Dis, so the the archives who were kept in the Aram el Sharif and Sherjara and Abu Dis, and this is the, the archives of all the uh, the work of Jerusalem. So because the Mogabi neighborhood was a work. 
uh, you will find everything. That we have to repair this wall, we have to change this window, we have to help this uh, orphan. We, okay. We have to distribute some bread for the poor because it was written in the, in the Foundation Act and so on and so on. Um, you will find a lot of documents about the Mogabi neighborhood in Istanbul and Ankara because, because the Mogabi of Jerusalem were like pilgrims. So they had to be protected by the imperial power, by the Sultan as pilgrims or ex-pilgrims. So they were, they were helped by Istanbul. Um, yeah, and sometimes even in 1907, you will see Istanbul, uh, read, uh, it's a note, not, not Istanbul, this it's written by the, by the Jerusalem governor to Istanbul to say that we have to take necessary precautions against the protection given to the Mogabi by the foreign consulate and mainly by the French. At the beginning of the French protection of the, of the Mughal. Um, here we are in the Open Jerusalem portal. You just type Mughal as a, as a, as a disaster. And we will have a lot of documents because the, the Dutch auctions in the Ottoman times are always going through the municipal institution to make it, you know, properly and in good uh, ways. Because, you know, auctions, it's, it's the place where you have to be very careful with. So every year, for example, for the distribution of bread to the Mogabi community, you will have documents in the, in the municipal archives. Um, yeah, you will discover that the Mogabi uh, population was partners for social activities of the municipality because they, they are um, helping the municipality um, to, for, for, the, for the orphans. There were a lot of orphans uh, discovered under Ram al Sharif. It was the, I don't know the name in English, uh, in French we say, the place where you let the babies when you don't have any money just even to feed them. So the municipality has to deal with it. With his babies, and uh, the Mogabi neighborhood was one of the places where they were, uh, yeah, they were uh, um, um, kept. Or, uh, here you will discover that there were a lot of Mogabis uh, who are municipal employees, uh, collector of tax, supervisor, controllers, street guards, and it's very interesting because you you can discover that. They have a position of like outsiders, but because they are outsiders, they are very useful for the municipality to control some things, you know? And for example, mainly all the, yeah, the collector of taxes, uh, Dogana, the, the, Dogana, the Duan, the, uh, yeah, custom taxes and so on. They use outsiders community because they don't want to, to, uh, to use uh, people who have direct connections with the big families of Jerusalem. It's very, very interesting. And of course, it's very easy because Al Hajj, Al Hajj Mohammed Al Mugrabi is someone from, from the Mugrabi community. Uh, yeah, just, this is to, to understood that the, the neighborhood, the na Mugrabi neighborhood, was not uh, uh, like uh, an, an abandoned uh, neighborhood and it was closely integrated to your bond control and municipal procedure. Uh, warning about a house about to collapse, 1901, in the vicinity of Babal Magarebe, savage repair works in Magarebe quarter, very urgent. Uh, where is the date? Yeah, 1902, this is the Umi. Uh, several in Magarebe neighborhood and so on. So you, you, you have documents about many, many issues, street cleanings, lightning, and et cetera. You will have a lot of documents in the French uh, uh, archives, of course, because what I said during the late 40s and the 50s. Um, after 1912, it is a Zionist history. So you have to go to the Zionist archives and you will have a lot of documents, sometimes in German, 
Um, this was, uh, it was Roberto Mazza who, who, who gave it to me. Uh, this was a negotiation between the Zionist organization and Jamal Pasha. Uh, in 1916, so in the very middle of the war, uh, because Jamal Pasha tried to sell the Mogabi neighborhood to the Zionist organization. <laughs> Jamal Pasha was quite a guy. <laughs> and of course, it, of course, the Zionist in, in after two or three months, they said, but how can he sell it to us? Because he is, he's not the owner of the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> he was selling a lot of things that he was not. And so <laughs> at the end they stopped. At the end they stopped. But it helps them to understand what was the juridical framework of the neighborhood. So the fight is very interesting for Jamal Pasha and for everything. And this is the, the late phase, and I will finish here, the late phase of the history, because when the neighborhood was destroyed by the Israelis in, in 67, uh, what was the main discovery for me is that I discovered that the inhabitants, um, they had some reparations. Not that big, but they had some reparations. And it gave, it gives an answer to this mystery. Why, why there was not a big scandal after the destruction? Because the, Jerusalem, the Israeli Jerusalem municipality uh, through Meron, Meron Ben Denisti, I think you know him, who was the, the, the deputy mayor, his uh, daddy colleague, uh, they asked every family to fill a form Exactly when, if you have, I don't know, fire in your house or water problems, and you describe, because they, the, 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 the neighborhood was destroyed in one night and the people uh, were expelled in two hours. So everything was in the houses. And so it's kind of post-mortem inventories. They described everything that they have, one table, two chairs, uh, one cotton, I don't know, uh, even uh, one kilo of sugar, <laughs> because because they wanted to get to to have their money back. So it's for me, it was a kind of you know Pompeii, Pompeii paradigm. Like the neighborhood was destroyed, but with these documents, it's possible to have a snapshot of the neighborhood just one hour before the destruction. It's crazy for an historian, and I discovered it in the municipal archives. Of course, he was not indexing like that. Of course. But because I knew Meron, because I had trust with Meron, because, and so he said, yeah, I was the guy who was involved in this process. Go in these boxes and boxes and boxes and maybe you will find. So just to finish to say that, yeah, it's an endless story because the more you know, the more you have abilities to, to find. And sometimes in boxes, not not well well uh, in depth. And just to finish with the with the comments that I'm publishing next year, to say that sometimes you have translation issue even more difficult than because we are translating it in English. It's not a problem in German, in Italian, it's okay. But we are preparing the translation in Hebrew and Arabic, and so we have to change the. But it's a problem when you have, for example, monuments, because we will have Alexa in the north. And, and so, yeah, comics is, is another problem for translation. Thank you very much. It's a little bit late, but maybe there's still time. You have still uh, some minutes before the concert starts today. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have a simple question. Yeah. Who is funding this project? Perhaps you. Ah, but, uh, uh, yeah, this, I should have said it. Uh, PRC, European Research Council. From Europe. From Europe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ERC is, you know, the biggest. Uh, institution in Europe, the European Research Council, directly it's in Brussels, it's directly uh, related to the European Commission, and they, they had big budget from 2010 
in the Lisbon strategy, like FP set Horizon 2020, they they big they, they 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 give big budget for this kind of transnational uh, transnational uh, budget. The budget was uh, the budget was one million and a half, which is the lowest level of budget that you can have that you can ask in Brussels. If you ask less than one million and a half. They, they even don't look at you. But no, just to, of course, it's not a budget, it's not a project that you can fund with like 100,000 euros or something because you have to pay people, you have to, yeah, it was kind of lab. It's not funded anymore, of course, this is the problem of the ERC process because you have five years, which is good, but you have to, to expense all the budget in five years. And after that, it's zero. So you have to be very careful about the, yeah, about the, 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 the robustness of the tool that you build. And you have to find some small budgets after that to maintain. And is the CRFG who receives the money? Or? No, no, no. It's direct from, no, CRFG, it's too big for CRFG. So who, who has received the, the, the my, my university in, uh, in Paris, Paris Est. Yeah, because you know to expand uh, to expense one million and a half in five years, you have to, and in Russia and Armenia and taxes and it's big. Uh, but now Europe ERC is really the yeah the place where from where you can launch this kind of project. And Twenty years ago, it was not possible. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, from, from the beginning, you mentioned some institutions that have quite a wealth of material that they're not willing to digitize, they're not willing to um, create as open access, so it could be invaluable to your research and to your publications. So I'm curious if you ran into any specific problems with the peer review process for things that people couldn't track down in the same order that you did by going to these uh, places in person. From the institutions and from anyone, any institutions that refuse to digitize or allow open access to, to the things you found valuable. Look, at the end of the day, on the now we have like 39,000 items on the portal, and one third for one third we have the digitization, which is not bad. Yeah. 13,000 and two thirds we don't have. Um, the 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 strategy was always the same, and it's. It, I think it, it was the good one. The first, we are not uh, focalized on digitalization, and second, and the end of the conversation. If it was difficult with the Armenians, it was difficult at the beginning with the Greeks, it was difficult with the Ethiopians, it was difficult with the Orthodox communities, frankly, because they are in the old city of Jerusalem, because the context is very difficult, because they have some you know um, property issues and in the archives you have documents about properties so it was uh, it was difficult but at the end of the conversation we ask them do you want to be on the picture or not and this is the final uh, issue for them if you don't want to be on the on the picture if you don't want to be in this project Okay, but it's very risky for you. And more than that, you can see that every institution, even in the old city of Jerusalem, they are working on their history, patrimony, museum. How many museums are, are, are uh, in preparation in the old city of Jerusalem? Even more than we know. Hmm. And it makes sense. And they, 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 it's, it, it's a good strategy. Because every institution in Jerusalem now, they know that in the present and future political context, uh, right of property is not enough. Okay? I think you understand what I said. So, because right of property, you have always lawyers and you have very good lawyers. Okay? And not only in Sharjah, but everywhere, even in the old city. Too. So, the only strategy is to build a legitimacy which is not only built on this paper or on that paper, but history, memory, patrimony. We are in this city for many, many centuries and so on. But, and not only like legendary, like uh, 
you have to be serious. You have to be, and you have to to try to have the pilgrims and the tourists visiting your places, your museum, and so on. So the Open Jerusalem project is is uh, I think had the chance to appear in this context, frankly, because we participate and we help the institutions to valorize their uh, history and patrimony. And in my opinion, and in their opinion, the best way to defend uh, your rights uh, in Jerusalem now. Uh, to, just uh, to uh, glance on uh, uh, Philip's question, uh, so uh, what about the Copts, the Coptic? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we had like all the Christian communities, but the Copts. No, we, did, we, did, we did work uh, on the Copts and in, in the Coptic uh, uh, archives through the Coptic, the, the Armenian Coptic and Ethiopian documents are like, it's not one documentation, but you know they are on the on the roof of the Holy Sepulchre, and they were exchanging their protection, misprotection, and they were in conflicts or in. Uh, so we had a lot of documents about the Copts in the Ethiopian uh, archives, a lot of documents about the Copts in the Armenian uh, documentation, um, because there were there there was this big issue when the time when the Ethiopians decided uh, at the end of the 19th century to institutionally not to be linked anymore to the Copts. You know the story, it's an institution, it's an ecclesiastical history in Egypt, uh, Alexandria and Ethiopia, and it has some consequences here in Jerusalem. The Ethiopians uh, made this choice to, uh, to move on and to put forward their Ethiopian identity, not as secondary church from the court. From, and it, it was, of course, in the time of nationalism in Ethiopia and so on. But so, and I have to check because do we have some documents from the Coptic institution? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, if we decided, for example, to have this institution is difficult to have the other one because the the level of conflictuality is too high but but we do we we did progress in the understanding of the links between the copt and the ethiopians because this is the very story of this micro neighborhood on the top of the of the reciprocal that uh, that you know i think even the doors open or not open it's linked with this in sense for, many thanks for your fantastic presentation. One, one question is, uh, could you elaborate a bit on your working relations with the Israelis? Uh, one. Uh, second, is the project finished, or uh, do you expect potentially to cover a longer period or to deepen a number of things? And third, did you have some perception within the European institutions on some interaction on, you know, because they finance it and can consider it? So first, the, the Israeli uh, institution, we did work with the Israeli state archives, the Zionist archives, with the Israeli municipal archives, the Israeli municipal, Jerusalem municipal archives. We did not focus, and it was written in the very beginning of the project. Everyone here, even without any competence or expertise, can understand that let's say it very simply. The archives in West Jerusalem are best uh, preserved and valorized than in East Jerusalem. Because, because of budgets, because of political uh, uh, you know, goal and so on. So there were less work to do in West Jerusalem than in East Jerusalem, just pragmatically. Um, first, the second thing is that the project is finishing in 1914. So before Israel state, of course we, of course we had discovered some documents in conservation, Israeli conservation places, Benzvi Institute, we worked with them, 
municipal archives, uh, state archives, Zionist archives, and so on. But it's documents produced by other institutions, for example, the Zionist archives, of course, onto the document for Berlin or for London, were now kept uh, in the Zionist archives. But uh, it was a kind of secondary, uh, secondary. And our more, the, the, the principal goal was to work on the local administration and institutions. So not to focus on, as, as I said on the very beginning, not to focus again on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the prehistory of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So yeah, so for the for the Israeli partnership. Second, yeah, and to be to be complete, we in this project, so it was funded by the Europe. The money arrived in uh, Paris in my university, and there was no official partnership with anyone. It was, I think, the best decision. So we had partnership and discussions, and uh, uh, yeah, and, and uh, positive uh, interaction with everybody, but no official partnership. Not at the beginning, we were thinking, yeah, let's a table and let's put them here and then there and then and it's an endless we work with everyone and who do want to work with us but not official partnership because it's very costly here uh, <laughs> you know i think what, what i mean um yeah is it finished no it's not finished yeah the funding is finished but as i said for example last week Last week, we, in, we implemented in the, in the database all the um, minutes of the Jordanian Jerusalem municipality, which is totally new. Uh, so these minutes are still kept in the Israeli municipal archives, which makes sense. In, in 67, the Jordanian, you know, they. They, uh, they, they went in like a few hours. They didn't take the municipal archives no. with them. It's not a priority. So the archives are there. We knew that it was there. But it, it took years to, to, to discover it. And this is uh, an excellent uh, uh, Palestinian with Israeli citizenship searcher. Um, we, yeah, we describe all the 700 something 720 meetings of the Jordanian Jerusalem municipality and so we now one now we are able to begin to work on the history of Jerusalem the, the history of the Jordanian Jerusalem I don't know what do you know about the history of Jordanian Jerusalem but we know very few very few like the repairing of the Dome of the Rock okay and the repairing of the Holy Sepulchre okay but there were 19 19 uh, years and there was a municipality there but so it was last week and um, yeah so yeah we are we are uh, moving on but of course with less money so it's 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 more it's more difficult and in europe we had uh, yeah we were we we had some uh, some exchange with them and so on we were not we were not interested to to make this project too political. It is enough political. <laughs> I think you understand. The political uh, uh, um, connection of this project are, are very easy to see, but we don't want to make it, to make political packaging. And if uh, any diplomat or anyone want to speak about it and sometimes they, they, they do it, but you know how diplomats are <laughs> very careful. So, uh, but they decided to fund the project and, uh, and they, they never stopped the support. Thank you very much, Vincent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.